Morning to everybody. In today's gospel, according to Mark, it's kind of one of those pivotal moments in the gospel. It's a turning point in the whole mis- ministry of Jesus and in kind of the foundation of the church. It's interesting because St. Mark, who wrote the gospel that we read today, St. Mark, it, it, a lot of people consider this to be the gospel of Peter because Mark was the sidekick of St. Peter for a period and was his kind of secretary. So you'll notice St. Mark almost never has anything good to say about Peter. Why? Because it's Peter himself talking about himself. And, you know, in his humility, he's not going to heap praises on himself. If you read the exact same gospel according to Matthew, uh, there's a whole section in there that is left out. So God, Mark says, Jesus, they just went to Caesarea Philippi, which is a very cool place, by the way. Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? The people give, the the disciples give the responses, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Jesus throws the big question at him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says in reply, you are the Christ. That's the end. In St. Matthew's Gospel, it fleshes things out because Christ looks at him almost with admiration, really. He says, blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And then he actually names him, you're about to be Pope. Says, On this rock I will build my church, etc., etc., okay? So this means that St. Peter was a man of profound prayer. He was a person, for all of his foibles, he was a person who followed Jesus, watched Jesus, reflected on Jesus, and prayed. And because he was a man of prayer, He received that inspiration from God the Father himself. And Jesus recognized that action. Now, interestingly enough, let's let's hang that question. Who do people say that I am? In the mind of the Jewish people, to say that Jesus was the Christ would mean you are going to be like a combination of a new King David and a new Moses. And maybe if you want, throw in a couple of prophets. But the idea was the Jewish people were expecting a Messiah who would usher in a new and glorious reign. A reign which would involve political prestige. Obviously, it's going to be a reign of righteousness where people follow God's will. But that by following God's will, God is going to bless this kingdom. He's going to raise up a new king. He's going to give them political power like he did with King David. He's going to give them wealth he's going to give them prosperity it's going to be like what we would consider an ideal kingdom from a human perspective and there's we have to take it easy on the jewish people i mean that was what they knew that's what they understood from the past that if you read the scriptures it kind of seemed to be what god was implying and jesus when he he when saint peter says you are the christ you are the messiah and jesus actually praises them he, he's saying, you're right, Peter. You're absolutely correct. But then Jesus pulls a big switcheroo because he says, okay, and the Messiah is going to suffer greatly, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. That was not part of anybody's plan. Nowhere, well, actually, sacred scripture did make reference, but they didn't understand that. It was not in anybody's mind. Now, St. Peter in this moment is curious because St. Peter, who sincerely loves, uh, respects, venerates Jesus as his Lord, Savior, as his Messiah, St. Peter, thinking that he is being righteous, says, Lord, far be it from you. What are you talking about? And St. Peter does something that I don't recommend anybody ever do. It says he rebukes Christ. Okay, pro tip. Okay, if you want to learn something, a, a pro tip for life. It never ends well when you choose to rebuke God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. In fact, it never ends well when you rebuke God, any person of the Trinity. Okay, so Peter had to learn this the hard way. He rebukes Jesus, and what does he get for his 
seeming affection, he gets the words, get behind me, Satan. Wow, he just named him Pope a couple minutes ago, and now it's, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking like man, or like God, but as man. Now, where does that come from? This gospel, I think, is closely tied to one that we read earlier on in the gospels, which was when Jesus went out into the desert. Remember, after his baptism, the first thing Jesus did He went out into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat or drink anything. He was praying. He was fasting. He was preparing himself. And at the end of that period, Satan appears to him. And what does Satan do? He tells him, essentially, if you are the Messiah, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Christ, God's chosen one, and you have been called to establish a kingdom, then... It's logical. Use the power that has been given to you to do the things that you would normally do to build up a kingdom. If you're supposed to be a king, use your power to become popular so people will follow you. If you're supposed to be a king, use the power that God has given you for a certain level of material prosperity and take care of your needs and whatnot. If you're supposed to be the Messiah, do things the way that you would like to do them. God has given you the power and the authority. Use it. It sounds so reasonable, doesn't it? What is the temptation behind that? Because each one of us can think that way. There's a very subtle temptation behind it, and it comes down to this. It is the mentality of saying, I have a relationship with God, I pray to God, you know, God, you and I, we're besties, okay, we got this. So, Lord, therefore, when I pray, I want you to give me the things that I want. And I'm going to, if holiness is going to come down to, I ask God, God gives it. Sounds reasonable. God himself said in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. He told us many times in the gospel, ask and you will receive sounds so logical but there's a problem and this goes all the way back to the garden of eden actually the problem is this when god made us it wasn't just so that he could give us that we could come to him constantly and say like an atm lord i need more i'm broke give me what i need okay our relationship with god comes down to this Am I willing to do what God wants? Am I willing, is my relationship with God a relationship where I say, Lord, thy will be done. And when Christ comes and says, I am going to be, I'm going to suffer and be persecuted and put to death, what he's saying is, I'm going to correct all of humanity's sins and mistakes of the past. I am going to come and I am going to do God's will no matter what. No matter what it costs me, even if it means being crucified, absolutely, radically, unconditionally, I will do God's will. That's a totally different way of living our faith. And that's really what it means to be Catholic. And this is what Christ came to give to us, to open up the doors to that kind of a relationship. Not only by teaching us and by being an example, but by suffering and offering up his life to open up the doorway to God's grace so that we can live that kind of relationship with God. And it's true. When we live a truly and authentic, deep relationship with God, you ask for what you want because you will ask rightly. You will always, in the end of the day, say, Lord, I trust in you to give me the things that I need, but in the end of the day, thy will be done. And if you ask something of me, even if it means suffering or death, thy will be done. What a radically liberating kind of faith that is. When we're no longer enslaved to our own whims, we're no longer enslaved to our own passions. That is what Jesus brought. I think a lot of us, when we, in our relationship with God, we deal with him like, or we think of him the way we think of the government, right? Okay. We like it when the government gives us benefits, especially if there's a natural disaster or something. Understandably, you expect, okay, government, come do something. We are powerless. The dam broke. Okay, we need your help. We got it. 
Um, but we complain when the government demands things of us. We don't like the government under any circumstance telling us what we should or shouldn't do. And we don't really trust the government a lot of the time. Frankly, with good reason. God is not the government. God is not the government, and that is not the kind of relationship that we are called to have. So let's return to the original question there. Who do you say that I am? Who do I say that Christ is? Do I say that Christ is the God who's supposed to be there and give me all the things that I want whenever I want them? Or do I say that God is the one who calls the shots and that whatever he wants from me, I will do his will because he is the Christ and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 